and uh, okay and uh, thanks again for the invitation to give this talk and putting up this really nice seminar uh, series about tunneling in QFT. Uh, today I'm going to share some results which are based on this recent work that we put last month on the archive where you can find all the details about what I'm going to talk about today. And this was a collaboration among uh, Lara Kuhn, Stefan Flöchinger, Jürgen Berges, and myself. And we wanted to investigate some question which comes from high energy physics. In particular, it's related to the physics of collisions and underization, in particular, particle production and the underization temperature. But we wanted to investigate it uh, using the framework of non-equilibrium quantum field theory. And we used uh, this effective model, which is the massive shingle model, which can be useful to explain some of the key features of uh, atomization. So um, if you have some questions, uh, just let me know by interacting me or reacting by Zoom. So I will try to answer uh, during the talk or also after the talk. So I'm going to start by some motivation and giving some uh, general introduction on the process we're interested in uh, with theoretical background on the electron positron collisions that we're going to specify on and explain the basics of this uh, model, uh, the massive shingle model that we are going to use and how this can represent some of the key features we're interested in, in uh, um, for, for the later uh, results which uh, um, are going to cover the field dynamics and particle production. And tunneling will play a role, a big role in, in this part, uh, as I'm going to uh, describe later. And then uh, in the last part of the talk, I'm going to uh, quickly uh, sketch some of the main steps um, um, that can be used to uh, simulate this uh, uh, model, in particular, some of the most challenging aspects of the dynamics using an ultra-cold atom system. So starting with some motivation, a uh, long-standing puzzle, which has been around for several decades and uh, has been studied by many, many groups, regards uh, the process of particle collisions. And uh, this, the, the puzzling part is that the experimental data are showing some thermal-like features. In particular, the particle multiplicities from the products of these collisions are very well described by a thermal model. And you can see here the example of an electron and positron collisions. And the products can be very well fitted by this uh, Boltzmann-like uh, distribution with a certain temperature, which is uh, around 160 mega electron volt. And now the remarkable thing is that this result is consistent across many different aspects. Uh, it's stable across different energy scales from just a few gig electron volts to the range of 10 electron volts. It's also observed in other collisions such as a proton-proton and proton-antiproton collisions, so elementary collision, but also heavy ion collisions. And the corresponding temperature, which comes out uh, from the heat, it's uh, uh, very um, uh, approximately constant. So in this range between 160 and 200 mega electron volts, and it's regarded as this universal temperature. And now uh, what we want to sh shed light on is what is the origin of this thermal behavior that it's uh, uh, observed. In fact, these apparent thermal features uh, could be explained in the case of heavy ion collisions because of multiple rescatterings and many reinteractions between the produced particles. But this explanation is much less plausible in the case of elementary collisions where the number of particles produced during the collisions and also uh, the number of secondaries, it's much lower. And therefore we need to find alternative explanation of these apparent thermal features. And in particular, we would like to develop a model which can capture what are the essential features that a model has to have to uh, recover this, uh, this, um, this fact. Now, the uh, particular collision that we are going to focus on, it's the process of an electron and a positron uh, annihilation into hadrons. And the process goes as this. So we have initially an electron and a positron, which are uh, colliding. And this results in the annihilation of both particles with the creation of a virtual photon. 
that then decays into a quark and anti-quark pair. Then after the creation of this first uh, pair, this will um, interact via the strong force. And during the dynamics, we'll produce many more particles. And I will come to this later. And the stage in the dynamics uh, that we're interested in um, consists in the transformation of these quark and anti-quark pairs into composite particles, which are then detected uh, in the detector. So this uh, um, is the adrenalization process. And this is challenging to describe for two reasons. First, it's an unperturbative phenomenon because we have to deal at uh, uh, scales where this adrenalization takes place, where QCD is strongly coupled because um, we are such at low energies. And also we are in real time. We have to deal with a real time process with the dynamics of all these quarks and their interactions. And therefore a Euclidean formulation of this problem is not possible. And we have really to use a real time approach to describe this process. Now, the underlying phenomenon, which is behind the fact that these quarks cannot really be observed as uh, naked particles, but are trapped into composite particles is the phenomenon of confinement. And in particular, the gluons are inducing an effective interactions between the quark and antiquark. And this interaction looks more or less like this in this sketch. Um, at very short distances, it's just the Coulombic interaction. But if you try to separate them further, it becomes qualitatively different and it becomes proportional to the separation R of the charges. And the factor in front is just a constant, which is the string tension, to recall the fact that the gluon field lines are sticking the quarks together and forming these uh, flux tubes. Then if you try to separate even further apart, this uh, interaction actually um, saturates and there is this phenomenon of string breaking such that uh, it's uh, energetically more favorable to generate a spontaneous pair of quark and anti-quark, which breaks the, init the initial string system into two uh, smaller ones. And this process can in principle go um, on uh, multiple times until it's energetically favorable. And at the end, the end products will be these uh, um, pairs or also uh, triplets of particles, which are the mesons and the uh, uh, baryons, which are then observed in the experiment. Now, there is not really an ab initial understanding of this phenomenon, but there are around many phenomenological models. And one of the most successful ones is the one developed in Lund, where this string breaking was uh, explained as a semi-classical um, uh, tunneling event where the expanding string fragments as uh, this tunneling event takes place with a process which is similar to the Schwinger mechanism in QED. And this uh, model has also underlies this PTI event generator uh, for which is uh, extensively applied for uh, high energy collisions and part in this uh, experimental data. But in the standard implementation, these thermal features are hard to reproduce unless one really put some uh, fine tuning and also involves many parameters for that. So we would like to develop an approach where this uh, whole process and the string breaking dynamics can be captured as an initial value problem in time with an effective model. And the model that we are going to choose is the massive Schwinger model, which is uh, quantum electrodynamics in uh, one plus one dimensions. So one temporal and one spatial components. So, and this is described by this action, which features the electromagnetic field strength tensor, which in this reduced dimensionality only uh, has one single independent component, which we identify in the electric field. And uh, then we have a mass term with uh, the mass of the fermion M and the U1 charge Q. And as you already may notice, this looks uh, quite different from the usual QED in three plus one dimensions and actually shows some similar features more to QCD in three, three plus one. And I'm going to show with this simple example what I mean by, by this. So um, if we consider now our original quark and anti-quark pair, which was produced after the collision, 
then this will be very highly energetic and will go back to back and separate and move along this light cone coordinates. Now we want to mimic this behavior with our uh, charge, uh, uh, opposite charge pairs, uh, which uh, in our uh, massive Schinger model uh, counterpart will start from zero and then uh, will move again along the light cone coordinates. And we can compute what is the field which is between these two uh, charges by solving the other Lagrange equations for the field. And it turns out that the electric field is constant within these two uh, charges, so, uh, and it's uh, proportional to the electric charge and a theta of uh, t minus x, while it's, it's just a background field that we drop uh, on the outside, outside the light cone. And this is useful because if we now plug this in into the computation of the energy which is stored into the field, which is a squared over two and integrate over all space, we find again this uh, 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 dependence on the separation L between the two charges. And we can identify once again, the string tension sigma as uh, the constant of proportionality is squared over two. And uh, so we have again, some sort of confinement, which in, in this case, it's a geometric confinement, given by the fact that the electric field does not have any other directions where to go. And, uh, and therefore it's constrained in, uh, in just one direction and, and uh, behaves similar, similarly as the case discussed before. Now, another um, convenient aspect of this model is that uh, it's very suitable to uh, simulate the non-equilibrium dynamics because it allows a bosonized picture with some bosonization relations such that the original fermions can be equivalently expressed as an action that uh, is in terms of uh, uh, real scalar field phi, where I now uh, um, here reported the action in general uh, curved coordinates because we are gonna need this later, but it has uh, just a, a standard kinetic term. And then we have a potential term, which has a mass term, which is proportional to the original charge of the fermions. But then it has also another interaction term, which is a cosinus, which is proportional to the U1 charge and to the mass. So for the massless case, this would be a free theory and it would be uh, even analytically solvable. But um, because of this term, actually for the case we're interested in is eventually also very massive fermions, so it can still be invested numerically um, uh, and uh, by simulating numerically the dynamics. Now let's have a closer look, look to this potential. Um, First of all, we see that uh, for increasing um, coupling kappa, which is just the dimensional coupling, which is constructed from the mass and the charge of the electron, uh, we see that for increasing coupling, there are, uh, apart from uh, a, a global minimum, which is the true vacuum of the system, there are more and more pronounced false vacuum. Uh, and uh, also the position of this vacuum depends on this free parameter theta, which was not apparent in the fermionic formulation of the theory, but it's just a background field and it's in fact related to the position of this vacuum. Now, uh, as you can see, the difference between these two is also that for theta equal pi, we have two degenerate um, uh, global minima, while this is not the case for theta equal zero, but all the other cases for other choices of theta will be much more uh, similar to the case uh, theta equals zero. And also the uh, results and the discussion that I'm going to present will not be uh, uh, so different for uh, the different the two cases. So I will only show the results for the theta equals zero and comment uh, uh, at the very end with the result for the other case of theta equals five. Now we are uh, ready to uh, set up uh, some uh, dynamics of this field. And uh, a proper choice of coordinates uh, is given by the physics in the sense that we, again, want to follow this quark anti quark pair, very highly energetic, so they move on the light cone, and we want to follow the string that forms between them and its dynamics and its break. So a proper set of coordinates is provided by these Björk coordinates, which are proper time tau, and rapidity eta, which are constructed from the Minkowski coordinates. 
And uh, as you can see by construction, these are defined only within the light co because uh, uh, this integral has to be positive. And uh, for later use, uh, we are gonna need this concept of the rapidity interval, delta eta, where eta is constrained uh, between these two values, minus delta eta over two and delta eta over two. And it's along a, a, a hyperbola of proper time uh, tau, which are these uh, red uh, uh, hyperbolas. While the uh, lines, the straight lines of constant rapidity are given by these blue lines uh, and uh, the, uh, the value of uh, uh, initial uh, like zero proper time tau equals zero will correspond exactly to the light contrajectories x is equal plus minus t. Now we want to use this set of coordinates and formulate the dynamics of the background filter. So the expectation value of our field phi, which is this capital phi. And we exploit the fact that uh, uh, this correlation function is boost invariant in the rapidity, which says that uh, it has to be homogeneous in theta, so will, uh, in eta, so it will only depend on proper time tau. And uh, the corresponding equation of motion will be a sort of Klein-Gordon equation, but by given the, this choice of coordinates, there's also this uh, additional uh, damping term, which is proportional to one over tau. And then there is some uh, other uh, in part which comes from the uh, interaction terms. Now to solve for the dynamics, we need to provide a proper initial condition for the field. And this comes again from the simple example that we studied before. In fact, for uh, uh, our initial conditions at tau that goes to zero plus, we know already that our electric field is just a theta function proportional to the theta function of proper time. And therefore, for tau that goes to zero plus, it's just constant and it's uh, equal to e. Now it's possible to relate the uh, uh, value of the field to the, our scalar field by this relation. And therefore, this initial condition can be translated into the initial condition of phi. And uh, this just amounts to setting up the field in the vacuum and then shifting in the global minimum and then shifting it by this constant of square root of pi. And then we can solve this uh, numerically. And what I'm showing you is the result for two choices of the coupling kappa. Uh, one is very, very small and the other one is a moderate uh, coupling just for uh, uh, some qualitative understanding. And as you can see, for the very small values of kappa, there are some damped oscillations of the field, which are due to this Bjorken time. And the field eventually settles down uh, pretty quickly in, the, um, in, in this global minimum. But this is not the case uh, if you increase this value of, of kappa. While um, where it happens that actually the field, yes, uh, starts to uh, show again damped oscillations, but around one of these false minima. And in a sense, it remains trapped there because these are just the background field equations. And so it does not have uh, any uh, fluctuation effect that would make it approach the true vacuum. And so it, it would remain trapped there forever. But this is only true at the classical level but we know that uh, in quantum field theory, if we have such a potential, which is very similar to the case that we are investigating, this is a pretty standard um, uh, configuration of a first order transition. So very common to also other uh, processes from cosmology to condensed matter problems. And we have a scalar field and our field will be sitting uh, in this false vacuum. And because we are, uh, uh, dealing with the full quantum theory, eventually the field with a certain probability will be able to go under the barrier by a, a tunneling event and materialize on the other side of the barrier and then further evolve and eventually approach this uh, true uh, vacuum solution. And now uh, to um, compute that, we can go uh, with the usual uh, Coleman prescription. We go to Euclidean time by doing an analytic continuation of, uh, of time to Euclidean time. And as a consequence, now our field, which was sitting in the false vacuum is now in the true vacuum. 
and can uh, have some classical Euclidean motion. And in particular, we are interested in one specific field configuration, which is given by the bound solution. And to obtain that, we are assuming that we are nucleating these bubbles, which are related to these field configurations. And these bubbles are uh, symmetric in the sense that they can be described by this radius, radial coordinate, which is just the sum of t squared plus x squared, uh, the spatial coordinate and the uh, corresponding solution to uh, our bounce uh, configuration is just uh, uh, the equation of motion of this field in this radial coordinate with this additional friction term. And the motion is now along this inverted potential. Now uh, we have again to uh, solve it uh, by uh, putting some additional boundary conditions and um, at uh, very big radii, the bound solution still has to be in the false vacuum by uh, while in, uh, it has to be smooth in the origin. So for R equals zero, the derivative in R has to be zero. And uh, now what I'm showing you is this solution for the bound solution by uh, the prescription I just explained, which is telling us that it's starting uh, for very small radii in the true, uh, in a phase which is closer to the true vacuum phase where the field has already uh, materialized to the other side of the barrier. And then it just evolves uh, in this radial coordinate to the false vacuum, which is located in this region. And what do we learn from here? Basically, we uh, can first study what is the value in the origin. So the bounds evaluated at R equals zero, and then this is just uh, the, our boundary condition. But we can use this information first if we want to go back to Minkowski space time in the sense that this radial coordinate, uh, which was written here in terms of Euclidean time, can be rewritten again by undoing this analytic continuation in terms of x squared minus t squared. So uh, here, this integrand again has to be positive. So this will be relevant only outside the light con, uh, coordinates, but it can also be relevant if we want now to kind of resume the time evolution of our field. And in this case, the usage of uh, the Birkin coordinate is quite beneficial because we can now translate our uh, condition into an initial condition for type equals zero um, by just evaluating again the bounce, uh, the bounce in the origin. And the other condition will translate into a vanishing initial velocity of our background field. And now we are uh, basically here, we, we tunnel to the other side of the barrier. And now again, it's possible to um, evolve. And the time evolution for a certain choice of parameters is shown here. And qualitatively, you always see that uh, from some new uh, position in field space, uh, then the field again shows these damped oscillations, but now around the true vacuum. And uh, eventually the, the field dynamic stops in the, in the true vacuum. Now we can put all this information together. So about the bound solution analytically continued and what we learned about the field dynamics after the tunneling. And we can also learn some interpretation about the underlying physics of the string decay. So as I already said, we uh, can just set uh, for coordinates inside the light cone. So this Lewis region, we just use our background field solution with uh, the new initial conditions. While for, field, for outside the light cone, you see this red part is given by the analytic continuation of the bounce. And now uh, it's maybe more instructive to see some cuts in uh, um, at fixed times, which are represented here in this other plot, but it's the same uh, kind of configuration. And you see that basically what we're dealing with is our initial string, which was, uh, let's say, metastable in the sense that we were still in the false vacuum. But then inside the light cone coordinates, there is a nucleation of a pair of quark antiquark pair which has been created with a certain distance. And then they also have the possibility to uh, expand and move outward because of this uh, bubble expanding and completing the phase transition with then a uh, positive velocity for, for these quarks. And as an effect of that, 
you see that they get separated and also they induce in this internal region some other uh, field which has been uh, is a sort of charge density which has been induced by this other uh, quark and initial quark antiquark pair which is moving upward and this will also will this process will uh, proceed uh, multiple times until and, and this generates these oscillations in the field until the initial charge has been completely screened by the dynamics. And this will correspond to the creation of uh, pairs of particles. Now um, we can use this information also to learn something about the particle production. Laura? Right? Yes. Can I ask a question about the previous slide? Yeah. Yes. Um, I just. Um, I didn't quite understand the this uh, this equation. So that inside the light cone you have, um, and outside the light cone we have the bounce solution, and and yep. the the other one is the classical uh, solution. Is that right? Yes. Yes. And what's the motivation for having th those two in those two different regions? I didn't quite understand that. Okay, I tried to explain it again. So basically, outside the light cone, you can use this result for the bounce solution and just analytically continue the solution. And this will correspond to this region outside the light. Now, the, let's say the boundary, we want to basically glue these solutions together. And the boundary is given by these light contrajectories, which will correspond to this tau equals zero region. And so it's basically the field, which at a certain time is at tau equals zero in the Earth coordinates. It's tunneling inside so there is this formation, and then the string has broken and then can evolve further with the string dynamics. So you have information outside and inside the light cone, and you want to just merge them together. Okay, thanks. Yes. Okay. okay, so now in the second part, we want to add to this background field solution some uh, small fluctuations around it, which uh, uh, compose this uh, initial field. And now this fluctuating field can be written now in uh, this mode expansion in terms of this k variable, which is the uh, conjugate variable to the eta, which is our rapidity with number. Then a and a dagger are the annihilation and creation operators, which obey the standard commutation relations. And um, u uh, and u star are these modes uh, which can be split into a mode function f. Now we want to uh, basically compute our particle number. And we do that in, in several steps. The first thing is to uh, really solve for the equations of motion of these mode functions for a given set of uh, parameters and for a given uh, with uh, number k. And you see that the corresponding equation of motion for the smooth functions is given by a very similar equation to what we had for our background field. There is also this additional term, which is proportional to this k squared. And this will depend on the evolution of our uh, field phi, the background field. So this was the linearization around this background. Now we have to, again, properly initialize our fluctuations. And our choice was to take at initial times uh, this form for the initial uh, mode functions, which are the uncle functions of second order of, uh, of a second order of complex order. And in particular, we specify this in the vacuum, and then we shift the field from the vacuum and compute what is the behavior of these mode functions. And by this choice, uh, you can show that. Uh, uh, Initially, we start in the in a Minkowski, in the Minkowski space vacuum omega, such that these initial operators are actually annihilating the Minkowski space vacuum for all k. And you see, again, for one single choice of the parameters, uh, um, the imaginary and the real part of these mode functions, which are actually growing in this case in time. So this was the first step. Now, um, we can proceed by observing that because of this Björken expansion, actually the field at asymptotically will end up 
in an asymptotic value, which is eventually the true vacuum of the system. And now, in uh, this very at very very late times in this asymptotic region, we can again write the uh, fluctuating field in terms of asymptotic mode functions and asymptotic uh, creation and annihilation operators, which now do annihilate the asymptotic vacuum for all k. So this can be actually computed analytically because this is uh, uh, can be solved analytically once uh, one specifies what is the value of the vacuum in this uh, uh, modified mass term. And to then uh, uh, proceed in our computation and compute what is the number of particles, we can say, we can ask what is the number of particles uh, asymptotically, so using this particle number operator a dagger a in the asymptotic region, but then we have to take the expectation value of this uh, asymptotic particle number, and we have to specify with respect to which state we want to calculate the particle number. And uh, our choice was to say, we want to calculate the, uh, the number of particles with respect to the initial uh, vacuum, the one that I explained before, this omega, which was actually annihilated by the um, uh, initial uh, creation uh, uh, annihilation operator. And therefore, to uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this calculation, but you have to re-express these two um, uh, operators in terms of the initial ones. And by doing so, uh, using the Bugolibov theory, and it turns out that the occupation number for the asymptotic state can be uh, computed by computing this uh, beta um, Bogolibov coefficient, uh, um, which is a function of this uh, k uh, absolute value squared. And in particular for our choice of metric and, uh, and system, it turns out that it depends on the mode function, the asymptotic mode functions and the corresponding proper time derivative squared times tau squared. Now the result is plotted in, uh, in, this, uh, in this graph here, where you see the particle number uh, as a function of the wave number. Now, strictly speaking, this uh, concept is observable, only makes sense at very asymptotic times by construction. But I just plotted it for many times to, sh to show that this is converging around this time, uh, 510, to some value, which is then um, not changing so much anymore from this value. And uh, the other observation is that you see that this particle number spectrum is showing a peak at k, uh, k equals zero, and then it's very strongly suppressed for, uh, uh, for a very uh, small wave numbers, actually. And the reason for that is that uh, uh, you can imagine that it's energetically more favorable to uh, produce particles uh, with uh, less energy, and therefore putting additional wave number on top, which is similar to sort of uh, velocity or sort of momentum to the particles, uh, then it's natural to, to see that uh, this kind of uh, profile is uh, what we were expecting, unless there are additional uh, resonance in the system, which we don't, do not see. And now by integrating up all this, uh, all this spectrum over all the wave numbers, we can finally arrive to the most important result, which is the total particle number. And we just have to sum over all this case, and then in the continuum limit, uh, by integrating up the spectrum, we can figure out what is the number of particles per unit of probability. And this is shown here in this plot, because we can repeat these simulations and this calculation for very many couplings, by varying this uh, dimensionless coupling k kappa, and, um, and then just fit uh, to the data in the regime where we have very strong couplings. And this fit to numerical data shows very good agreement with an experiment, uh, with an uh, exponential behavior for this regime. So we can just fit what is the coefficient uh, constant of proportionality here in front of k. But now, we can interpret this as a Boltzmann factor because, as a reminder, we know that uh, we defined our um, kappa, which was proportional 
to the uh, fermion mass, and we can re-express the uh, fermion coupling uh, with respect to the string tension sigma. And, and then we can group all these uh, numerical constants and, and uh, observables and express it as e to the minus m over a temperature, what we call a temperature in the sense of what I, what I explained for. So in the sense that this really reminds uh, a Boltzmann factor for the particle number. And now the corresponding temperature is given by this one. So we can plug in the result for our fit. This is just the Euler constant. And uh, we see this uh, proportionality to square root uh, of the string tension sigma. And we now have to kind of use an estimate of this uh, uh, constant, which was taken by this work, and figure out what is our prediction for the temperature. And here is the um, final result 40 equals zero, which is 63 meter electron volt. And, uh, uh, 40 equal pi, which is a bit larger, so uh, 112 mega electron volt. And uh, the surprising thing is that uh, in both cases, this is quite close to the uh, transition temperature, which uh, was observed uh, in QCD case, which is a hint of the fact that probably this uh, uh, dimensional uh, reduction and also this confinement uh, um, property are some of the essential features in this process. Now, um, uh, I would like to move to the uh, last part of the talk, which was now um, an idea to test some of these predictions of this model uh, using an ultra cold atom system. So going from very high energy to very low energy. And what, what do they have in common? Basically, the idea is to have another system, which we can build in our experimental lab, which uh, effective potential really resembles the effective potential of our Schwinger mode. And in particular, the interesting things to test are, again, the stage of the dynamics where false vacuum decay matters and also the particle production. Now, this experimental system um, was based on another proposal, uh, two other proposals that were formulated in the past where they wanted to investigate really false vacuum decay. And you can find all the details here. And this can be realized in principle uh, using uh, two component was Einstein condensates, for example, using a double well potential or two hyperfine states. So you need two components in your system. And then the corresponding Hamiltonian is given by this kinetic part, uh, then a self-interaction, an interaction between this uh, intraparticle interaction. And then this, uh, um, the most important part is given by this, um, um, again, in, uh, this uh, interaction which makes uh, uh, atoms go from one to the other state. And this can be mediated by an external field and it's very important that uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, constant uh, is time dependent. And in particular, the modulation of this coupling at a very high driving frequency will create our false vacuum. Now, um, go I'm going a bit quickly, but you can understand that it's more convenient to go from our uh, uh, single uh, condensates into phase and density representation and then switch from the single um, um, density and phases to the sum and differences of the two. And it turns out that uh, by integrating out and uh, several decouplings that happen in the system, the effective Lagrangian for the relative phase, which is given by um, the difference between the two phases in the system, which is uh, an uh, accessible uh, experimental value, can be described by a relativistic uh, field equation in such a potential. So after you further uh, take the time averaging of the uh, of this modulation of this modulated coupling, it turns out that the effective potential is given by this periodic one, which features uh, some false vacuum and some true vacuum. And uh, so this potential is not exactly the potential that we had in mind initially but it can be tailored uh, by tuning the experimental parameters uh, in such a form that uh, it's very similar 
to our QED one plus one potential in the region between the true and the false blocking, which were the most important uh, part of the potential that we want to probe. In particular, this V0 is responsible for this uh, separation of these two points, uh, and the lambda is related to the depth of this, uh, of this voice minima with respect to the maxima. And so by uh, bringing them to a very similar form, uh, we can uh, do this for also, I just uh, reported uh, t equals zero case, but this can be done also for the t equal pi case and in principle for other values of the, of the parameter theta. And um, with that, uh, um, it would be uh, for sure very interesting to have such an experiment to compare to our prediction. And uh, with this, I am already going to the conclusions. So first of all, uh, we employed our effective model, which is the massy Schwinger model, which is QD in one plus one dimensions, to investigate the string breaking dynamics and in particular, we observed that for moderate and strong couplings uh, in our theory, we have to uh, solve for the field dynamics by uh, incorporating the tunneling uh, event, which corresponds to the string breaking. And then we can follow the subsequent dynamics with uh, per production. And this is summarized by this plot. Uh, but then the particle production itself can, and the uh, occupation number spectrum can be uh, also computed. And this leads by integrating up the, um, to the uh, total particle number per unit of rapidity, which uh, behavior goes very similar to a Boltzmann factor. And also quantitatively, the uh, corresponding temperature uh, agrees quite well with the QCD result. Finally, uh, we... Um, uh, proposed a uh, possibility to test some of these predictions and also guide some of the uh, stages of the dynamics using uh, uh, an analog, analog system for the Schwinger model, where you can tune the experimental parameters such that they become uh, close in some uh, limits to the uh, QVT 1 plus 1 case. So, uh, of course, what we uh, worked with was a very simple model, a toy model for QCD. And it would be uh, interesting in the future also to incorporate other features to build a more realistic toy model uh, because we neglected so many, many, many things that QCD has. And also uh, so far, we did not include any back reaction of the fluctuations into the field dynamics, which of course would um, additionally bring additional damping into the dynamics and we would modify a little bit uh, the, the, the result and the, and the, uh, and the damping uh, of the field dynamics. So with that, uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Laura, for your very nice talk. So are there any questions? Okay, Oli. I have many questions, but I won't ask all of them. Um, one is, it, um, so this relationship between the temperature and the coupling, you had that the temperature was somehow, so you, you computed something in terms of the coupling, and then you argued that that was somehow inversely proportional to the temperature. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, can, I didn't quite get the argument. I, I, and I sort of had an intuitive feeling. So could it be related? Is, is this model, is the Schwinger model asymptotically free? Is it that at lower temperatures at, in the infrared, we have a stronger coupling, something like that, like in QCD? No. Or no? How, how do no, I see the relationship between temperature and the, 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 the relation is only for the strongly coupled case. Uh, so in a sense, you, I don't know if this is, was your question, but we are not saying that we are in thermal equilibrium we just make a claim about what is the uh, ratio of multi multiplicities or at least what is the distribution of the particles for a certain mass so this would be really the fermionic mass uh, that we started with and um, 
this is similar to what is observed uh, in the experiment, even if the theories in principle don't agree on, on all energy scales. Is okay. strong coupling low temperature here? I haven't quite understood. Is strong coupling low temperature? Strong coupling means... Um, Kappa uh, and P. Very massive. Oh, M, sorry. So yeah, it's related to M, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. so, so very massive fermions. Right. So in a sense, if I understand it correctly, it means that as long as tunneling is a good description for hydronization, then this always going to come out. Yes, in a sense, yes, because if you don't take that into account, uh, this result would not be uh, as accurate. So in a sense, yes. So the tunneling gives them the, the possibility for the field to create all these particles in the end. And so in a sense, uh, it's the key mechanism to to observe this uh, temperature. Okay, do we have any more questions? Maybe I can ask something about the cold atom picture. Mm -hmm. So are you proposing to uh, compare this with the experiment? Are there some experimental data uh, available or how does it work in that case? So, as I said, um, this uh, uh, BC proposal was not original idea. It was already being proposed, but uh, as far as I know, I haven't seen an experimental realization of that. So, in case this would be realized, it could be also applied here. So, in a sense, yes, uh, it can be re realized uh, with uh, uh, with the current uh, experiment, but I haven't seen any uh, experimental data yet. Um, so is the idea here that you are in phi plus equal to pi? That's your false vacuum. Yes. So you want to start to tunnel to pi minus. Yes. Uh, it seems to me that here you have more directions uh, in on the blue than you have in the QED. The QED is more. No. Okay. QED deviates from this behavior um, after the false vacuum. But if you assume that you really start from here and you want to tunnel to the true vacuum, then you will stick to this region in field space. Therefore, you will not explore, you will not resent of this uh, deviation so much. Um, at least this is uh, the idea. Okay. Thank you. OK, if there are no further questions, we thank Laura again for a very nice talk. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.